progress, you have to have a struggle. <laughs> and that's what I'm going to talk about today. If we didn't have a struggle, we'd never progress. Everybody says, why do you dress up? I said, well, if I'm dressed up, I feel better. If I didn't ever get dressed, I'd feel horrible. So now I'm dressed up and I want to wish you a welcome. We are very optimistic. We've got many, many chairs empty, so please invite your friends. I want to also tell you that without struggle, there's no progress. And let me tell you my personal story on that. When I was in the first grade, I brought home a report card, had straight D's, no attention, all kinds of bad things. My daddy had called me Jim till I was seven. And when I was seven, he says, what do you want to name your little brother? And I said, Jim Tom. So when I was seven, I went to school in Texas and brought home that first report card. And my mother, I was afraid to even see her. I've got your coffee right there. <laughs> um, but my daddy called me Snooks. As soon as I lost Jim, then he called me Snooks. You remember baby Snooks. Maybe some of you are not old enough, but I remember baby. So he said, Snooks, come sit in my lap. And I did, and he said, Mark, Snooks, I'm going to love you for the, if you stay in first grade 20 years, I'll still love you. And he gave me the biggest hug I've ever had. I went to school the next morning, looked around, and I said, 20 years. <laughs> Guess what? I became a professional teacher and counselor. And I think it's the way Christ is with us. If we have Christ in us, it's like my daddy. He'll love us. No matter what we do, no matter what our struggles are, but we will make progress if we just keep at it. Christ is in all of us, and I want to wish you the best weekend this week. If you're sick, say, God help me, and get up and get dressed. Right? Okay. sing our next hymn, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. <laughs>
the expression the way is used, it is referring to the church. Christian church uh, was referred to as the way back in this period of time. I'm reading Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 22. Now Saul, still breathing the threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, but get up and enter the city. And it will be told, and it will be told you what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground and threw his eyes, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias? And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus, Tarsus named Saul. For he is praying, and he has seen in a vision, a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. For Ananias departed and entered the house, and after laying his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me to so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he got up and was baptized, and he took food and was strengthened. Now for several days he was with the disciples who were at Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. All those hearing him continued to be amazed and were saying, This is not, not he who, who in Jerusalem destroy, destroyed those who called on his name and who had come. Here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests. But Saul kept, <clears throat> kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that this, Jesus, is the Christ. Amen. Please join with me and sing our next song, I Need Thee Every Hour.
Good morning, family. Good morning. Good to see everybody. Now you can see the artwork, right? We had to fade it out so the lyrics show up. But that is that is a um, Jim. Is that acrylic or oil? Oil. That is oil on canvas. And is there is there a title to that? No, I never given title. But name it what you will. Swan Lake. <laughs> Will that work? I think that's original with me, but uh, you know, we there are so many talented people in this congregation, uh, and we have artwork uh, from many, many people, and um, we love to share that. And if we can share that on the screen, and if you'd like to share that with the church family, we'd love to have that. Len, I know you've got some birds in your inventory, right? Yes. We'd love to see some of those as well. We're going to gather our hearts around prayer right now. And um, will you join me? Father, thank you. As the song we just sang um, reflects our hearts, we need you. We need you every hour, every moment, every breath. <coughs> Every breath we take is a gift from you. And Lord, we pray today for those who are ill and not here today. Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of Jeannie. And Lord, that you would watch over her. Help her to be stronger so she can join us again. For others, Lord, who are facing procedures or surgeries this week, Thank you that you are there with them. Thank you that you're guiding the physicians, the medical staff. Thank you for the staff here at Sagewood who help us in so many ways. I think of Ashur who every Sunday brings many of those from Acacia here so they can worship with us our security staff, our Lord, our, our, our waitresses, our waiters, those who work in Acacia. Lord, we're thankful for each and every one of them. And Lord, as we gather today, continue to work in our hearts. Continue to give us insight into your will for our lives. Thank you that we can rejoice in your name because of the grace of God, Lord, we have salvation in Jesus Christ. It's not something that we've created. It's not something that we have conjured up. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And it's a marvel that you would save us, but you have. And so, Lord, our prayer together is a reflection of our heart when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Will those helping with the offering please take their positions? Thank you so much.
it on now. There we go. Can hear you. Well, it's good to have you here. Thank you so much. I got a question for you today as we open up our third week in this great book called Galatians and the series on freedom from religion. Um, oftentimes in our culture, people get stuck in a religious rut. And what I mean by that is they go to church, they check the boxes, and they forget that what we're doing is about a vital relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Galatians is a letter of liberation to free us into the grace of God and to enjoy that relationship that we have with Christ. But I got a question for you today. How do we really know the gospel that we have believed in? How do we know it's really the gospel? I mean, we survive. <laughs> we, we've been taught this for most of our lives. For me, it was the day I went to the nursery and on up. We were in church every week. But imagine if you came to the end of your road and realized that gospel wasn't really the gospel. It was something other message. How would you feel? What would you be thinking about? Now imagine those who are clinging to a, another gospel that we talked about last week. Imagine those. Imagine how confused they would be. And they are. How do we make sure that the gospel that we believe in is truly the gospel? Why is that important? Well, we talked last week about that granddaughter that came back for Thanksgiving dinner, remember? And basically repudiated everything that she'd been taught her whole life. And now this, this you know, during the second helping, everyone's passing the cranberries, she now tells you that it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. All roads lead to fill in the blank. God, right? That's a belief out there. All roads, believe, all roads lead to God. So it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. Is that really the case? Paul was being attacked. Saul, by the way, that we read about, came to become known as Paul. And that happens between Acts 13 and 14. And you can read about it there. Um, Paul is being attacked by the false teachers at Galatia for two reasons. Number one, he's not an apostle. He's really not an apostle. It was just self-appointed. You know, he, he went online and bought a certificate saying, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. And he paid $99.99 plus shipping and handling. Right? And he's really not an apostle. And oh, by the way, his message that he's doing, that's just nothing but an easy believism. No wonder why he's got great crowds following him. Because it's easy. Just believe. Doesn't matter. Just believe. And the false teachers were saying, no, you not only have to believe, but you have to keep the Mosaic law. And you have to be circumcised and keep the dietary regulations and the Sabbath and this and on and on and on and on. The Galatians were confused. And so they began following these false teachers instead of Paul. And Paul takes up pen. And last week we learned that he said, if anyone teaches a gospel other than the one I taught you, let him be accursed. No small language there. This week he continues that thought, but he comes back to a personal defense. He defends his apostleship and he clarifies what is the true gospel? And he gives us three tests to understand what is the true gospel. So when your granddaughter says, it doesn't matter as long as you're sincere, you have these three tests right here that you can ask her and say, does it do this? Does it do that? And does it do this? Right? Very simple. We're going to keep, as my prof used to say, we're going to keep the cookies on the bottom shelf today. So anybody can reach them, right? That's where we want the truth at all times. So how do we know? Paul says the first way we know is by testing its origin. Can you tell me where that thought is from, granddaughter? All roads lead to God. Can you tell me where that originates? Will she be able to tell you? It's something that she's heard. It's something that she's been taught. It's something that's been passed down in her classroom. But there's no proof of its origin. Paul says, take a look at this. Here's the origin of the gospel. 
For I would have you know, brethren and sister, I don't know if that's a real word, but we'll put it in there anyway, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. In other words, first of all, I didn't pick it up from man. No one taught me this. No one gave it to me. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it. He wasn't indoctrinated. It wasn't something he picked up. Even from Ananias in the, excuse me, the city of Damascus after he was saved, Ananias didn't give it to him. It wasn't something he went to seminary about and learned it there. It wasn't something that he stopped at a roadside cafe and found something written on a, on a napkin. It wasn't from, from man. Well, if it wasn't from man, where did it come from? He said, I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. I find it interesting, this word, the word revelation, I say that the revelation, it means something that was not known in the past has now been made known now. <laughs> so when the Lord Jesus met him up on the road to Damascus, the Lord presented to him the gospel. He says, I am Jesus. And it's hard when you're kicking against the goats. I'm the one that was crucified and now I am alive again. That was the revelation. He was one of the only few people who saw the risen Lord. And it was a revelation of the Lord Jesus himself. Today it's pretty easy to examine false teaching because we have scriptures. We have the full revelation right here. And I can examine anyone's teaching after they're done teaching. I can go, is this true? Does it jive with this? Does it filter through this? But even with this, there are many being led astray today who don't filter the message through this. Because there's teachers out there who use the words of men and women. In fact, if you analyze any cult, there's one thing in common, folks. They will say, oh yeah, we believe in the Bible, but, and they'll go back somewhere in their library, but we also believe in these writings of our leader, Joe Fabietz, whoever Joe Fabietz is. And what happens is over a course of time, the Bible starts to be pushed to the back seat, and Joe Fabietz starts to raise up to the front seat and begins driving the vehicle. That is the first sign of a cult. When they emphasize someone's teachings, or books, or pamphlets, or whatever, over the scripture, that's their source. Paul says, my source isn't any of that. It came through a revelation of Jesus Christ, right from God himself. Paul makes it very clear. So the first test is, where, you know, the first test is, is its origin. Where did it come from? Tell me more about that. How do you know it came from that? Paul says, mine came right from Jesus Christ. Can't get any closer to God than that. He is God. Second one, by testing its theme. This is very important. Because again, this is where cults go astray. Because cults will, they believe in faith, but they always pass in works. They always throw in some form of religious activity. It's okay to believe in Jesus, but you need to be here every time the doors are open. Or it's okay to believe in Jesus, but you also need to have this secret handshake. Or whatever it might be. And the only way to get the secret handshake is by coming to this meeting where you're indoctrinated with more stuff. Paul says in this section in 13 through 20, actually it's 13 through 22, we learn how a man who killed for his very God, he was an up-and-coming leader in, in, in the Jew Jewish faith. He was incensed with stopping what is known as the way. All of a sudden has this transformation. And you're thinking, what in the world could have caused this man to be transformed? Saul the persecutor became known as Paul the apostle. Paul takes us through three steps of his spiritual journey in these verses. He talks about his life before he became a Christian. He talks about his life during the time he became a Christian. And he talks about his life after he became a Christian. And oh, by the way, this is a great outline for those of us who are thinking about building our testimony. We talked about this a few weeks ago about how to do that. Well, Paul's emphasizing it again. Notice what he says here as we read together 
He says, for you heard of my former manner of life. You know about my past, but let me just review it with you. He's talking about I used to persecute the church of God. That's the first thing. Beyond measure, I tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. There's three things he identifies about his past life. He was a persecutor of the church. He was advancing in Judaism. And he was extremely zealous for ancestral traditions. Those are just not platitudes. Those are three key things. Persecution, we know that. He was putting people in jail. He was killing others. In Acts chapter 6, he holds the clothes of the people. Sorry, a little puberty there. He was holding the clothes of those who were stoning Stephen. And he was giving consent by holding their clothes. He was a persecutor of the church. Second, he was advancing in Judaism. That term there doesn't mean the Jewish faith. It's talking about a Jewish tradition that people would study um, more of things outside of Scripture rather than things inside the Scripture. It reflects a merit-based form of salvation, not a faith-based. We talked about this before. How did Old Testament saints get saved? The same way we do, by faith. They weren't saved by keeping the law. So there were Jews still living by faith at this time and being righteous. But there was this sect of this Judaism that Paul was a part of that they created all kinds of laws in addition to the Mosaic law. And the only way that you could merit God's favor is to keep all these other laws that man had created. And that was what was known as advancing in, Jerusalem, uh, in Judaism. But then he says, I was more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. This is interesting, because this still goes on today, where men and women are trained in, in certain seminaries and certain colleges, not to study the scripture, but to study what other men and women have said about scripture. And so what do you have? You've got a bunch of robots who know how to recite the words and studies of men, but they couldn't fight their way out of a paper bag when it comes to studying this. That's what Paul's talking about. I was advanced in those ancestral traditions and studying. He goes, he knew them all. He goes, I was beyond my contemporaries in this. I was extremely zealous in this. This is my past life. This is the before I met Christ. But then he turns to verse 14, 15. But when God. We're going to do a study one of these days about those two great words right there. But God. Two great words that we will do a study on eventually. This was happening. But God. That was happening. But God. Notice what Paul says. But when God, who set me apart, even from my mother's womb. Now, that doesn't mean that he was orphaned and his mom died or she went on a trip. Or, it just means that at the moment he was conceived, what? God called me through what? That's the theme. That's the theme of the message. Grace. God called me through his grace. Why did Paul put this phrase, from my mother's womb? Does that sound familiar to anybody? Jeremiah the prophet was called. And in chapter 1 of Jeremiah the prophet, it says, he was separated from the womb to be called a prophet to, to, Judah, uh, to Jerusalem and Judah. And the Jewish reader at this time that Paul was writing to would have made the connection just as Jeremiah was called to be a prophet from the womb. So now Paul is called to be an apostle. He's defending his apostleship of who he is. And he said, God called me. I didn't make it up. I didn't create it. I didn't invent it. God called me. And God was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. God set him apart. God was pleased to reveal him. 
And he articulates that salvation is not something we work for. It's by grace. The false teachers were saying, oh yeah, it's faith in Christ plus in the list of works. Paul says, no, it's by grace and by grace alone. That's the theme. And that's what was being attacked. And it's always being attacked when you're dealing with cults. His grace is attacked always. Thirdly, God called Paul by grace so that he might preach among the Gentiles. What a great picture. God didn't, uh, Paul didn't say, I think I'm going to go do this. He was a Jew of Jews. If you read Philippians chapter 3, he would have never thought about going to the Gentiles to preach. What do you tell me? Not a chance. He wanted to be in the synagogue. He was a student of Gamaliel. You've heard that name before. Gamaliel was an outstanding Jewish leader during the time of Christ. Very wise rabbi. And Paul was setting himself up to replace, probably, Gamaliel as the top head ancho of the Pharisees. He had no interest in being the Gentiles. So when you see him say this, you're, it's, it's hard for us to picture this. But it's like taking your, your favorite football player on any sports team. You, you tell me who your favorite football player is. And all of a sudden you wake up one day and you find out he quit football to become a ballerina. And you're going, what? That makes no sense. This is Paul, the apostle of the Gentile. He's, what? That doesn't make any sense at all. To the Gentiles? Are you kidding me? What caused this change? It's the grace of God. That's the power of the gospel. That is the power of God's grace. God's grace changed a man focused on religion to a man focused on a relationship with Jesus Christ. So what happened? What did Paul do after this time? We've heard about before. We've seen what happened during. What did Paul do after he was saved? Oh, I know. He went back to all his buddies in Jerusalem and said, hey, I got the truth now. Right? How many think he did that? No. Well, wait a minute. He probably went back to Jerusalem to talk to Peter and James and John and all the other apostles because they would, they would welcome me with a ticker tape break because I'm an apostle to the Gentiles now, right? Even though I just killed a lot of their friends. But don't, don't forget me on that, right? He, he did that, right? He went back to the apostles, right? No, he, he, he didn't do that either. So, so what did he do? He said, I didn't immediately consult with flesh and blood. There it is. In other words, he didn't talk to Ananias about this much. Ananias just confirmed what Jesus had said to Paul, that you were to be a messenger to the Gentiles and to kings and to the nation of Israel. But he didn't consult with Ananias. Ananias didn't give him any heads up like, you might want to think about doing this or change your message to that or, you know, whatever. No, none of that went on. Verse 17, I, I didn't go to Jerusalem to those who were apostles. So he didn't go see Peter or James or John immediately. But I went to, a, where? I don't think there was any McDonald's drive throughs back that day in Arabia. Do you? Where is Arabia? Well, let's figure it out. This area here, from Damascus all the way over here, was ruled by another king, and I just forgot his name, forgive me. But it was a, he was basically another Herod the Great. He, that's not his name. But he ruled like Herod. And he controlled this whole area called Arabia. Some of it was desolate, but Damascus in this area was inhabited. And there was a king's highway that came down from Iraq and Iran all the way down like this and it went over to Egypt. And the king's highway was part of this area. So that was a well-traveled commerce road, like the 101. Lots of shops and things like that along the way. Paul went here. He went there for three years. 
And people say, well, what, why, why did he go there? And we're not sure if he went to the wilderness area down here or if he kind of stayed up here towards this area. There's a lot of debate on that. The point is he went to Arabia. That's the point. And why he went there, there's a little bit of debate, but we all can agree on this. Well, let me let John Stott explain it to us. Let me back up here. John Stott puts it this way. In this period of withdrawal, as he meditated on the Old Testament scriptures, because that's all they had, on the fact of the life and death of Jesus, that he already knew, and on his experience of conversion, the gospel of grace of God was revealed to him in its fullness. It has even been suggested that those three years on Arabia, in Arabia were a deliberate compensation for the three years of instruction which Jesus gave the other apostles, but which Paul missed, obviously. Now he had Jesus to himself, as it were, for three years of solitude in the wilderness. Can you imagine going to the seminary of Jesus Christ and hanging out with him for three years? I'll take that. Right? Paul went into the wilderness, not to debate the issue, but to study with Christ side by side. Because for years he's been studying the Old Testament scriptures and all those commentaries, and yet he missed the boat when it came to understanding how Christ is weaved in and out of the scriptures of the Old Testament. And Christ opened up his eyes during these three years of how the Old Testament predicted the Lord Jesus. And the prophecies that we see in the book of Psalms, like Psalm 22, where he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Isaiah 53, about the Lord's servant. He was despised and, sp and stricken. They plucked out his beard. And by his wounds we are healed. And all of a sudden, Paul's light bulb in his head went on. He goes, I can't believe I've missed that. But that's the power of grace. Grace opens our eyes to understand the scriptures. Paul was in Arabia, and then he returned to Damascus. Thirdly, we understand how to know we have the, the gospel truth by three ways. Number one, by testing its origins. Number two, by testing its theme. Is it of the grace of God or not? If it's grace plus anything else, it's not the gospel. If the origins are Jesus plus anything else, it's not the gospel. And then Paul says, test it by its results. What does it produce? And a lot of cults get a lot of credit at this point. They've got nice families. They're good people. Nothing against them. But their gospel doesn't have the theme of grace. It's grace plus works. And their gospel doesn't have the origins in Jesus Christ. It's, it's Jesus plus their leaders' writers. Paul says, three years later, I went up to Jerusalem. Three years later, folks, underline that. That's when I first saw Cephas, otherwise known as Peter. And he only stayed with him for 15 days. Tell me, do you think Peter had any significant influence in Paul's teaching after three years in the desert with Jesus? and only spending 15 days with Peter? Do you really think Peter had any influence on him? Other than welcome to the family? Peter didn't change his doctrine. Didn't change his teaching. And then he saw James, the Lord's brother. He says, I didn't see any other apostles, only James. And then he says, now what I'm writing to you, I assure you before God that I am not lying. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. Now Cilicia, going back to this map here, Cilicia is, there it is right there. And it's a province that contains his hometown, Tarsus. Paul stayed here for about seven years after that event. And we'll find out what happens to him when we study the book of Acts. But let's look at the results here. He goes, result number one. He goes, I was still unknown by sight to the churches in Judea, which were in Christ. But they only kept saying or hearing, he who once persecuted us. Don't 
skip over that word. This is the guy that was putting these folks in prison, killing some, and chasing others out of town. Remember that. He once persecuted us, is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy, and they were glorifying God because of me. Two results. Number one, you can't tell me that the grace of God is not working in the lives of these people. This is a human power that can forgive a man who killed relatives. Paul was a religious terrorist. And he didn't care. And he thought it was doing God a favor by getting rid of them, what he called the way at that time, otherwise known as Christians. Beloved, imagine if a Muslim terrorist came to know Christ and you know that Muslim terrorist had something to do with the murder or death of someone that you know, how easy would it be to forgive that person if they walked through this door and said, I'm a born-again believer. God has forgiven me. By the grace of God, I am what I am. That's the position they were in. But notice their response. He who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he tried to destroy. Folks, that's not human power. That's not self-will. That's not mental improvement. There's no human will there. That is the power of the grace of God working in the lives of people to forgive someone like that. And the second result, they were glorifying God because of me. It's beautiful. If there's any other result than God being glorified and lives being changed, it's not the gospel. Usually in cults, man is being glorified. They put him up on stage, put the spotlight on him, or the woman. But in, in the church, when we meet together, it's not about any one of us. We're here to worship and glorify the Lord Jesus. In a Heritage Bible church, we will go to our death fighting for the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because we believe that its origins is of Jesus Christ. Its theme is the grace of God. And the results glorify God and change lives. So how do we know the gospel truth? By testing its validity. By testing at the validity. Testing its origin. Testing its theme. And testing the results. Three ways that you can challenge anybody. Or if anyone challenges you, this is how I know the gospel is the gospel truth that we believe in. So, let me ask you a couple questions here. For those of you who know Jesus Christ, you know what we've talked about today is the gospel truth. This is a, a review for you. You know that. But do you know how to share it? Paul gives us a beautiful outline of how to prepare our testimony. It doesn't have to be long. It's not about preaching. It's about telling your story. Three words. What was my life before I came to know Christ? What happened at the moment Christ invaded my life and changed me? And how has my life changed since then? Before, during, and after. There's your outline. You can say that in two minutes. You can say that in 90 seconds between the first floor and the fifth floor to your doctor's office. When somebody goes, what makes you different? Let me tell you before. Let me tell you what happened during. And let me tell you what happened after. You're not looking for a conversion. That's God's job. Before, during, and after. For those of you who are still kicking the tires and still thinking about believing in the gospel of Jesus Christ, you have been told clearly today, this is the gospel truth. Its origin is in Christ. Its theme is the grace of Christ. So why not give God the glory and believe in his son, Jesus Christ, today? Three ways. Three simple steps. Acknowledge you've been living your life apart from God, just like Paul was. Believe 
that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, just like he said he was. And confess him as your Lord, and you will follow him. Acknowledge, believe, confess. God is calling you today. We know that we are not going to live forever. Some of us could be taking our final breath tonight. Hopefully not. But are you ready to meet the Lord Jesus Christ? I hope you are. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. We live in a pluralistic culture, society, that wants to water down everything, including the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for your word that gives us solid ground to stand upon, to show us that we have the gospel truth. Thank you for the writers of the New Testament, like the Apostle Paul, who was faithful to write down the things that you showed him, that we have today. Help us to build our story, Lord, to tell others. And for those who are still thinking, Father, draw them to yourself, that they will experience the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and trust him with all their heart. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Please join with me in saying, turn your eyes upon Jesus.
our benediction for today. With his blood, this is a chorus from the song, My Tribute. With his blood, he has saved me. With his power, he has raised me. To God be the glory for the things he has done. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed.